Roberto Rivellino was born on New Year's Day in 1946 in Sao Paulo, Brazil, to Italian immigrants from Macchia Godina, a commune in the province of Isernia. Inspired by Pelé, Garincha, and the World Cup winning Brazilian sides, he started gaining an interest in football from a young age, playing futsal, indoor football, at Club Atletico Barcelona in his hometown. He graduated from futsal to professional football and moved to Barcelona's biggest rival, Corinthians, after being rejected by arch rival Palmeiras. At Corinthians, he quickly drew the attention of Jose Castelli, one of the great idols and top scorers of the club, responsible at the time for the club's lower categories. Castelli recognised the 19 year old's rare skill on the ball and potential approving him for signing as a Corinthian in 1965. At 5'7", Rivellino had a low centre of gravity, which enabled him to be very agile with strengths in dribbling and shooting on his exceptional left foot. The Sao Paulo fans instantly fell in love with the young midfielder, believing he would lead them out of the worst dry spell in the club's history. They hadn't won a Sao Paulo State League title since 1954. Rivellino settled in nicely at the Parque São Jorge and began to excel for the side. On the ball, his technique was marvellous, able to beat defenders with trickery that he had picked up from his time as a street player. Along with this, he had a great eye for a pass and, with experience, became even more able to execute them. On his favoured left foot, he was amongst the most dangerous players in the league. When given any space around the box, he would powerfully strike the ball and find the back of the net frequently. Nicknamed Ore de Parc, meaning King of the Park, he was a dominant force on the pitch, and teams would defensively focus on closing him down to stop him from working his magic. In 1966, the national side was preparing for the World Cup and selections were finalised. As back-to-back -back world champions, Salasau was a particularly difficult squad to get into, and a year into his professional career, Rivellino was overlooked by Yal Saldana, a decision that only made the Corinthian more eager for the famous yellow shirt. Over the next four years, on the road to the 1970 World Cup, Rivellino was often benched, and in the qualifiers only featured for half an hour, scoring against Colombia but began to earn game time due to his leading performances in the domestic league. His efforts proved worthwhile, and he was chosen for their World Cup squad, yet whether he would feature in the tournament was unclear, as his position for Corinthians as an attacking midfielder was the same as Pele's for the successful national side. Saldana was reluctant to changing his starting eleven that had won all of their qualification matches and therefore Rivellino's hopes for involvement were dismal. Background tensions between the manager and the Brazilian Football Association's president, Yao Avalenge, came to the forefront, stemming from disagreements in team selections. This ultimately led to Saldana's sacking and the appointment of Mario Zagallo, a forward for Brazil in both of their World Cup triumphs. Zagallo, in the second year of his managerial career, had a fresh approach and was more open to change. His plans included Rivellino, solving the positional dilemma by placing the cam on the left wing, which revolutionised his international career. Though not especially pacey, the king of the park could skillfully come out on top in one-on-one -on -one scenarios and create space for a left-footed shot or cross. As their number 11, he travelled with Salasau to Mexico for the tournament, and though national belief in the side was low, the three months spent preparing physically under their young manager gave Brazil a confidence. A slow start against Czechoslovakia was corrected speedily by Rivellino, who earned the name Patada Atomica, or the Atomic Kick, with a vicious bending free kick to equalise. Zagallo encouraged showboating, by incorporating skills in the game to express yourself, and the Brazilians returned to the pitch for the second half to stun the world. On the ball, the South Americans beautifully controlled the match with a flowing dynamic style that many of the global audience hadn't ever witnessed. 
Overwhelmed by Brazil, the Europeans suffered another three goals by the final whistle, and Brazil's dominance in their first fixture spurred them on for their upcoming match against the cup holders. As expected, the English were difficult to break down, and the game was deadlocked until the 59th minute, when Jarzinho stole the winner, and they topped the group with a clear route to the final. Fellow South Americans Peru were their quarter-final victims, against whom Rivellino claimed the early opener with a first-time driven long shot. The team were very tactically disciplined, following out Zagallo's instructions to a T, and doing so with their natural flair. This made them impossible to predict, and the Peruvians couldn't cope, conceding four goals to Salazar, who comfortably progressed into the final four. There was a perfect contrast between the two wingers. Jorginho on the right was a speedy, strong, direct forward, while Rivellino was a more reserved, intelligent, wide midfielder, who could seek out gaps for a pass and take on defenders with his unique skill. Pele sat between them as the second striker behind Tosto to form one of the best attacking units ever seen on the international stage. Brazil's third in their 3-1 triumph over the two-time champions Uruguay was netted by Rivellino, whose status in the sport had drastically changed across a couple of weeks in Mexico. He had gone from a young talent of his hometown club to a world-renowned name of football. It was at this time when Riva showed the planet his own skill move, named later the flip-flap or elastico. Originally invented by the Japanese-Brazilian player Sergio Achigo, Rivellino learnt it while in the Corinthians youth side with him, and worked to perfect it for use in Zagallo's team. The Brazilian confused opponents with the trick, sending them one way before quickly reverting, all in one move and on one foot. Famously, the Brazilian camp couldn't even replicate Rivellino's skill, including Pelé, one of the most skillful players of all time. The Corinthian proved that he deserved this level of recognition in the final against Italy, crossing for Pelé, who headed in there first. Brazil oozed confidence in their decisive match, and in the second half, continued their run of ridiculous scoring. Gerson and Jarzinho put the game out of reach for the Azuri, but it was Salasau's fourth which made a statement. Within the remaining five minutes of the game, the move started from their own half, and the nine players involved demonstrated their teamwork and on-ball elegance. This was not only Brazil's best performance in the competition, but their easiest victory driven by their unmatchable desire to reclaim the World Cup. At the time, the world of sports fell in love with the 1970 Brazil side, which is now regarded as one of, if not the best ever, footballing sides. Rivellino was one of their most consistent performers and a standout of the tournament, thus attracting many international fans including a 10-year-old Diego Maradona, who later listed Rivellino as one of his great inspirations. Back in the Brazilian Serie A, the world champion looked to achieve some domestic success, but across the next four years in Sao Paulo, Rivellino and the Corinthians failed to grasp any silverware, causing the nationwide supporters to grow even more desperate. In his ninth year with the club, the king was under severe pressure from fans, who had expected him to deliver results and titles to end their 20-year drought. In 1974, Corinthians had a chance to finally do this, facing Palmeiras in the Sao Paulo State Final, a side that the talisman said he liked to face. Expected to give their all, Corinthians were ultimately underwhelming, and Palmeiras claimed their 17th Paulistao, Rivellino was the scapegoat for this loss, harshly blamed by fans as the key reason for their failures when, in reality, the whole team wasn't clicking. Hurt by these unfair judgments, the King of the Park left his hometown and moved to Rio, signing for Fluminense in 1974. After a decade as a Corinthian, 
during which he scored 70 goals and established himself as one of the greatest to ever step foot on the Parque São Jorge, Rivellino's time in Sao Paulo unfortunately ended on a sour note. For Brazil, Rivellino replaced a retired Pelé as the star of Seleção, but the overall team was weaker than it had been four years prior. Back in his preferred central role, the midfielder helped the side rescue their campaign after a poor start, and they qualified for the second round. The new number 10 truly stepped up. Another unstoppable free kick was converted by Rivellino to give the Brazilians a 1-0 victory over the East Germans. Four days later, he gave Zagallo's team the lead against South American rivals Argentina with a venomous long shot in the 32nd minute, a game that Brazil won 2-1 after the 90. Unable to repeat these magical moments versus Johan Cruyff's Dutch side, Selassau failed to respond to their two goals and conceded a place in the final to the eventual runners-up. As Brazil's top scorer, Rivellino personally had a very strong tournament as the country's leading performer, but the side seemed dated when compared with the West German and Dutch sides of 1974. In Rio, the Fluminense fans were excited to welcome a world champion to their humble club, and instantly he met their high expectations. In February 1975, Rivellino made his debut for the side in a friendly against Corinthians on Carnival Saturday, a sacred day for the country and Rio in particular. Despite this, the Maracanã was packed full of Fluminense fans, who witnessed the 28-year-old exact revenge on the club that exiled him. Rivellino scored a stunning hat-trick in their 4-1 victory over Corinthians, proving his old side that the cause for their lack of success was not him. The club president Francisco Horta assembled an outstanding side that included either current or ex-Brazilian internationals, dubbed the tricolour machine. Fluminense in the mid to late 70s played gorgeous football, reminiscent of the 1970 Selecao, and won consecutive Carioca Championships in 1975 and 76. Finally, Rivellino experienced the success that had eluded him at club level for so long. As their key playmaker, he was Fluminense's star of this great period, able again to play with flair and score epic goals for the Rio club. His most famous was against Vasco da Gama. From stationary, Riva used his elastico skill to get round his marker before gliding through the defence with grace and slotting away a left-footed finish. At the age of 32, Rivellino had one final shot at lifting the biggest trophy in football, having been called up to Brazil's 1978 World Cup squad. In Argentina, he was Selecao's most experienced player, but to some, he was too old and shouldn't have featured at all in the tournament. A fresh injury hindered the likelihood of Rivellino's game time, and he acted as a mentor to the younger players, offering advice, helping coach the team, while also Zico's reserve. Overall, he made two appearances in the yellow shirt, and though individually his performances paled in comparison to those in the prior competitions, his influence inspired Brazil to a third place finish. This marked the end of Rivellino's international career, and he retired from the Brazilian national team after 92 appearances with 26 goals to his name across a 13-year span. In the twilight of his career, Riva departed Rio and Brazil as a whole in favour of Saudi Arabia's most prominent club, Al Halal, where he spent three successful years in the Middle East as champion of the King's Cup in 1980. Prior to their 1981-82 season, disagreements with the owner Prince Khalid forced the Brazilian into a premature retirement at the age of 35, when Riva actually aimed to hang his boots up into his 40s. Upon his homecoming, Rivellino eventually opened his own sports centre in Sao Paulo, which still runs as of 2021, offering a space for young talents to practice as the streets that he grew up playing in become more gentrified. Roberto Rivellino was a generational talent, known as one of the true artists of the sport. 
Naturally gifted from his teenage years, he was selected for Brazil at just 19, on the verge of Seleção's golden era. There was an aura of Rivellino, a rebellious attitude in his play, and obviously his signature aesthetic of a long stylish moustache with curly long hair resonated with young viewers, and alongside his 1970 national side, spawned a different type of passion for the game. He influenced many of the following generation's South American stars, who wanted to play with the elegance and inventiveness of Rivellino. Rivers' feints, close control and no-touch dribbling have lived on in the modern game, and the Elastico especially is still emulated by some of the biggest names. Able to beat powerful defenders while standing at just over 5 foot 6 inches tall, the King of the Park inspired the more diminutive footballers into believing they can thrive just as he had on the world stage. Famed for his left foot, the versatile forward could bury difficult chances from range and is regarded amongst the best set piece takers of all time. Tragically, Rivellino's name no longer holds the weight that it deserves, underused in contemporary conversations about Brazilian football and the 1970 side. As a compatriot of Pelé, Carlos Alberto and Zico, Riva was both blessed and cursed. He featured in superb teams and won the ultimate football trophy, yet he somewhat overlooked in the modern era, overshadowed by the megastar that is Pelé. Had he played in Europe in his prime, Rivellino would have garnered far greater success and his name would be truly universal. A great of the 20th century, his legacy should live on forever remembered by all as one of Brazil's most gifted ever talents.